Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here at the Dakota Camp Meeting, isn't it? Have you been blessed so far? It's a good day. This afternoon, we've got Elder Gil Webb. And uh, Elder Webb is a retired minister and a former vice president of the administration of the Mid-America Union, a graduate of Oakwood University, and he entered full-time ministry before I was born. So, and that's in 1976, so I'm giving you away my, my age. But he served for 44 years. Uh, being a minister for 44 years, you've got a lot of wisdom what's going on in the churches and in, in the spiritual life of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And he served in various capacities in the conferences, including youth and Pathfinder Director, educational superintendent, assistant to the president, and, and the ministerial director. So he was a pastor of pastors. His ministry experience allowed him to engage with church offices and in effective leadership and its function in our church. He's married to Patty, his wife, for 44 years. And um, we were just joking about, the, when you look at the program, Dr. Valentine is also married to a gill. And uh, his wife said to him, she thought she was married to him. But um, it's, it's another gill, I suppose. <laughs> so... Uh, they've got two children, four grandchildren, and um, they love them dearly. But I invite you now to just bow with me when we dedicate this session to the Lord. Heavenly Father, what a great privilege it is to be gathered here and uh, to listen to Elder Webb. Um, we are all ears and uh, we worship together, but sometimes there's hot topics and hot potatoes in our churches and in our lives. And we pray that you will be the mouthpiece and that you will carry the words of Dr. Webb to the ears of those gathered here. Jesus, we do this all for you and only for you. And um, thus we are gathered here to have fellowship with you and together with Elder Webb and his family. We pray this lovingly. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, my brother, for the kind words and the reminder. I, my, my wife did say to me that, she, you know, I, when she showed, showed me the program, I said, Gil. And then, then I met uh, the other Gil and was comforted by the fact that it was really me that she was married to and that the other Gil had his own wife. Uh, his, his name is Gilbert. And I'm Gil. He asked, was Gil a short for anything else? I said, no, Gil is Gil. And his is Gilbert. I'm going to, uh, when, I, when I saw the president this morning, Dr. Weir, I, I said to him, you know, I, I see I'm overdressed and uh, I maybe need to. And he said, don't do it. And I said, okay, I will. And so <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to do this, on, take this because we deal with hot topics. <laughs> and uh, I want you to feel comfortable in this area of hot topics. Uh, you know, I, I, I grew up in the church. My mother died when I was three. My aunt raised me. Um, and in the church, I know it's probably different today, but... Uh, Friday night, Vespers, bring in the Sabbath, Sabbath church, and then sunset Sabbath, Saturday. Um, I don't know about you, but when I was young, I was not too in encouraged with that idea. I didn't necessarily like the idea of not being able to play with my friends on Friday evening. Uh, I lived in my neighborhood, you know, everybody wasn't a Christian, everybody was not Seventh-day Adventist. And, and so it is that... Um, it almost seemed like punishment to me. 
and I couldn't play with my friends on Friday evening. I had, I had to go to church. And or have the old folks come to the house and they'd be singing songs about God and Jesus. You know, and I'm sitting up there, my friends outside playing and I've got to sit in the house Friday evening and, and not do anything. And then get up in the morning and go to church Sabbath school and put on nice clothes and, and, and go to Sabbath school and then church in the afternoon and, and come back home, couldn't do anything in the afternoon, Saturday afternoon because it was still Sabbath. Uh, but I was a young person. I mean, anybody had like, before anybody else have kind of experience, you know, you know um, it just seems so, so unhuman-like. You you, you got to get up and get dressed and go to church, and, and well, Friday night, you know, my my, not my my friends, we played baseball in the streets, we played football in the streets, we ran track, we did a lot of stuff, and so when when the sun set. I had to run into the house, and my friends wanted to come on out, Gil, I, I got to go. <laughs> they can't, it's Sabbath. They didn't, couldn't quite understand that. It wasn't until later on in life that I learned to appreciate the day of rest. Not so much the day of rest as it is the Lord of the Sabbath. Um... Young people have a lot of things going on. And so part of the discussion this afternoon, and I say discussion because I don't want you to feel that I'm going to preach to you today or this afternoon. Sometimes we can get a bit preachy and miss the young people. And the church today I saw a group of young people. Were they going on a field trip out there? I think that's a good thing. So we who are not as young as we used to be and, is not <laughs> and not as young as they are, and yet we must be mentors and role models, and, and we must, again, uh, understand that we cannot expect them to be where we are today because we are where we are today by the grace of God. Amen? Uh, how many of you, my 92-year-old sister, again, she grew up in the church. How many of you grew up in the church? Whoa. How many did not grow up in the church? Oh, okay. Now, when I say church, I'm about church, period. Yeah. Any church. Okay, not the church, okay, yeah. Uh, and so, as youth director, I served from 1998 to 2005 as youth director, Pathfinder director, uh, adventures, all of those that deal with young people I served as and with. Uh, and over time, I did some real interaction with young people because I felt that I didn't know who in the congregation or in the church would be would have had the experiences I have had who would be sitting in church with their parents not really not really in church you follow what I'm saying in the building but missing in the building but not getting the blessing in the building, but not really hearing, but hearing. Hearing, but not listening. How many young people sit in church, even in your church today, uh, come to church? And they, you know, they, they may even, if you have a youth choir, they sing in the choir or the church band or they're doing the school program, they're in that. But yet there, there is no real connection with the Lord of the church. So, uh, Sean McDowell, Josh McDowell's son, he writes a book and he talks about young people and the church. Many churches give up on young people because of what they're doing, what they're wearing, the color of their hair, how they talk, all the tattoos on them, and some church folk just look at them crazy. 
like they are crazy. But yet, they are in a building where God's presence is supposed to be, and perhaps is, but they're not connected. Uh, so I, I, I want us to take a moment and dive. I, I read this. Let me, let me give you this song. I'm not going to sing, okay? <laughs> Here are the words. I hear the sound of the new breed marching toward the gates of the enemy. We're armed and dangerous, strong and serious, clothed in righteousness. It's a new breed. And the person that writes the song, wrote the song, is not Adventist, but he's got a group of young people sing with him, and they're committed to the idea of we cannot be like the church used to be. We've got to go out there and conquer for Christ. Uh, you know, coming to church and finding your seat in your pew, knowing where it is. <laughs> uh, we went to search one, one week, we went to church, and a family I know we know we're very good friends with, uh, she came and said, y'all sitting in my pew. <laughs> now, she was having fun, but the reality is, in many places, it's the truth. You're sitting where my pew is. And I think that we have got, we've gotten to the point that we've been so comfortable with pew assignment that we've missed person arrangements. You follow me? We've gotten so tied up with Sabbath. We've forgotten about service. We, we've got tied up with rules and regulations. We have missed reaching for the master. And so this songwriter, Israel, of the new breed, he says, I hear the sound of a new breed marching towards the gates of the enemy. Now they're marching with marching orders. And I would, I would tell you this, I, I played a song similar to this at a youth event. And uh, if, you've, if you have ever been to an African-American arrangement and meeting, uh, there is some excitement. <laughs> there is some energy. Uh, there is some get up and do it. You know, uh, there is some, I'm so glad to be, no, no, no. You, yes, ma'am. She, hey, she's been around for 92 years. She knows. She, <laughs> yeah. Yes, you know, so you know what it is. So, so I, was, I was in the church, and I had, I had a youth meeting, and we were there, and so I played this music. And you should just see all the older folk in the church just looking around. What is he doing? Why is he doing this? Well, it wasn't for you. It's for the young people. Um, so Josh McDowell's son, Sean, says that we miss our young people because we don't discuss hot topics. And they get in their groups and discuss hot topics, issues that are relevant, issues that are pressing, issues that they are dealing with, issues that parents won't talk to them about but they have to deal with. Um, so Sean suggests that we begin the dialogue about what we can do to make church cool, not cool for young people. Because at the end of the day, I'm getting older. I don't know if anybody else is getting older like me. Uh, I just had a birthday. What, this is June. I just had a birthday. I'm not telling you my age. I just had a birthday in May. Uh, and I'm not too far away from 70. Uh, so I to use to give the gospel to young people like themselves. I, uh, if you've watched sports, <laughs> football, <laughs> uh, and different things, if you notice there are people that are in the game, the players, They'll make their little signs up to God, and they will come at the end of the game and, and say, God has been good, and you, you, just a little while ago, they were cussing. You, have you seen any of that? You know, they still praise God, even though they've knocked somebody down on their backside to get their touchdown. When they get done, I just want to thank the Lord. I want to thank God for being so good to me. How do they do that? How out of one side they say something wrong, 
On the other side, they say something right. Or is it my conclusion that what they said wrong is wrong? She sat in this location, and I came by and asked her how things were going. She said, fine, I'm doing ministry. Did you go to church? No, I didn't go to church. I was under the bridge. What? I was feeding the homeless. Huh? Yeah, feeding the homeless. Don't, do you remember what that's what we're supposed to be doing? I'll say that for, for tomorrow. But, but the reality is, my brothers and sisters, hot topics are somewhat taboo. So I want to take a few moments this afternoon, because we're living in a, in a time now that there are a lot of hot topics going on. And I don't know how comfortable you are with talking about hot topics. I'm comfortable. I'm retired. <laughs> the, former president, the former treasurer of, of Mid-America, Troy Peoples, he said, one thing I like about retired ministers, when they come to camp meeting, they don't pull any punches. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time, but I figured it out. He's right. <laughs> because we have no job to lose. <laughs> Nobody's going to vote us in or out. <laughs> We're cool. We're good. But I will be careful. <laughs> but if there's some hot topics, see, I made some of you all smile on that. It's good. Some hot topics. Any hot topics that you, that you feel that you want to talk about that your children are not talking about? Or that you talk about, period. Anybody want to share a hot topic? Conversation? Now, now, now listen. It might be too hot. Yeah, that's fine. That's, yes. I would say um, that LGBT thing, um, that our kids are doing this in everyday society. And for our generation, we're still in the Midwest, not having to be exposed as much to some of it in daily life that we can be um, judgmental easily. And they're saying, super important to me that any person is still seen as a child of God and I don't feel like being more judgmental than what you are to any other child of God. <laughs> On point. LGBTQ and whatever else come after that. Uh, it's a hot topic. And we will only say certain things about it around certain people. Uh, and when we talk about it, we kind of guard ourselves. But our young people are looking at us, listening to us, and if we say something that's wrong or right the wrong way, we're judged by it because we're judgmental. Um, Marty, uh, I grew up with Marty in California. If you know anything about California, there's some nice places in California and it's some nice, life, nice lifestyles in California, San Francisco. Marty uh, grew up in the church. And um, Marty was known to what kind of person he was. Well, I left California and went to school and be, became a minister. Folk didn't believe that was true, but it happened. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, I was pastoring in Denver. And would you believe it? Marty came to church. He didn't know I was a pastor, and I didn't know he was coming. But I knew Marty. Uh, I had options. I said, you know, well, Marty, hey, man, you know, glad to see you, brother, but you know, you got to change some things. Or I could say, Marty, good to see you, man. Because, first of all, the people in the church would detect what kind of person Marty was because Marty was not high. He was not tough and buffing. And so I had to, when I saw Marty and I greeted him, I talked with Marty. I sat with Marty. I embraced Marty. No COVID. Marty. You follow me? When I embraced Marty, that changed the whole tenure, whole tenor of the church. We baptized Marty. There was no condemnation about what are you doing and how come. But today, now, lest I am misunderstood, I know what the scriptures say. I know what is written. You follow me? I know what I believe. And this, my sister, may cover a whole lot of areas so that you're clear on what our calling is on hot topics. 
God is the judge. I might be one who thinks about what is right or wrong. And I could be right in what I'm thinking. But I have no heaven to send them to. No hell. At the end of the day, I could do more damage to the person because I want to stress my point of view and put it out there so that people are clear on where I stand because I'm concerned about my reputation, how I am read, and miss the opportunity to reach a soul. We talked about it this morning. The Lord added to the church as many as, this, as should be saved or could be saved. They came as not saved, but after all, over time, they were saved and are being saved. Some will be lost, but that is up to the Lord's choosing and more so their choosing for God so loved the straight people. Which ties in, let's, let's hold on to that because I've got to come back to that. Any other hot topic besides that? Because some of you are trying to say, well, where is Pastor Webb coming from? Where is he? Does he, you know, we'll get to that in a minute. Any other hot topic? That's the only hot topic? We can stay here. Jewelry. Je jewelry? No, that's not a hot topic. Not today. <laughs> the wearing of jewelry is a hot topic? Earrings. Tattoos and earrings? Pierced tongues, lips and noses. Yeah. You go, you, I go to, to McDonald's, or I go to, to Taco Bell, and the person waiting on me has a, something out the chip. You know, and I got to, I wonder, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know. So, but again, that's somebody for whom Jesus died. And tattoos are so mainstream now. They have tattoo parlors and shopping malls. And <laughs> I, I, went, I went to do some, I, I'm planning. I planted some sweet potato slips. You know what sweet potato slips are, right? You, yeah, I, I planted some. I planted three in a 20-gallon 20, 20 bag. You know, uh, but I went to, to, uh, to Menards or to Lowe's, someplace to, to get some stuff. And I saw this guy walking. I said, well, that's a neat shirt. And I looked closer, it was a skin. <laughs> it wasn't a shirt at all. It was all covered up. I didn't say it out loud, of course. <laughs> I said, well, that's a neat shirt. But it Everything, everywhere that I could see. And I'm saying to myself, I would never do that because I'm going to get old one day. <laughs> and how will that look? Or, boy, to myself, how does man decorate God's body? But then I had to realize that that's not where it is because the outside is not what the deal is. It's what's inside. It's not what comes out of a man, but what goes in. And so we got to get to the point of, yeah, they, they're going to wear the earrings in the church used to have a stand against jewelry. No earrings, no rings, and no nothing, no lipstick, you know. But now if you go to a church, you can come to a church, you see everybody, and you don't know who's an Adventist, who's not Adventist. And by the way, I think we might be stuck on Adventist. I know it's risky now. We're not going to invite him back. <laughs> but many of us are stuck on our denominational name without any real trust in the Savior. At the end of the day, he's not coming back for Seventh-day Adventist 
by name. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but sometimes we are the greatest condemners of the world. And so our anchoring is not our personal anchoring, as my sister just cited. We have to anchor our young people. They, we are their role models on how we handle non-Christians or non-believers or people who do different things. We are their, they, they read us. And God forbid that I say something to Pat about the boy down the street, Jonathan, whose his pants are hanging down and the girl's coming over his house when mama's not there and she's decked all out and he's supposed to be a member of the church. And somebody hears me say that to Pat, then they, young people, get in their groups and they talk. And they say, well, my mama said, or my daddy said, well, my, I would love my child. So, well, you know, my dad loves all people. And he calls sin by his right name at the right, name at the right time. Any other hot topic? Well, that covered it. Jewelry and, 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 and tattoos and uh, gay lifestyle or LGBTQ and all that. You've covered that. How many are clear where what your stand is on those issues? How many are clear where you are on that? You, how many of you are clear? How many are not clear? How many don't want to say anything? <laughs> Well, I'm not the judge, so, so the Lord knows your heart. So, I mean, it's okay not to be clear, uh, but we ought to be clear on this, that we cannot send anybody to hell. We sure can open the gate wide by our responses and our actions. I grew up in a church, in the church, no jewelry. After a while, they started wearing wedding bands. Move from wedding band to here's nice you know, earring, and I've been to churches where the usher earring, her earrings are dangling, her lips are purple, hair's green. <laughs> welcome to, and I'm gonna say, what are you welcoming me to? No, I'm so, I'm so glad you welcomed me. Why? Because I'm sending a message, and I'm establishing a relationship a rapport, I'm not letting down the standard. I've got to lift up the Savior and I can do it better in an environment where a person trusts me. And if I'm condemning them, finding fault with them, I'm losing trust with my children. In particular, why pray for my child to be saved if I'm condemning others and my children hear it? So I back up. The Lord is the judge. And we've got to get that in our minds that the Lord is the judge. If we knew about Judas, what the Lord knew about Judas, we would have never washed his feet. We would have kicked him out of the circle. Huh? But the Lord let Judas hang on to the very end. He never did expose him. He never did say, you're a, you're a hypocrite. He never called him out of his name. And in fact, the, the disciples, some of them didn't even know who he, what, what he was doing until the day in the garden when he denied Christ. And even at that, Peter cut off Malchus' ear, not Judas's. And Judas was a part of the group. So, so in this area of hot topics, we've touched on some things that the church is concerned about. And sometimes the church is not very clear. Kind of fuzzy. How many feel like it's kind of fuzzy? Oh, not too many. How many think it's pure and clear? How many don't know what the church stands is? <laughs> well, that's good, maybe, in this way. The church's stand, if it's not based on scripture, is the wrong stand. And what is the right stand about a person who has a, a wrong lifestyle? They caught her in adultery, they brought her to Jesus. He said, stone. They said, stoner. And he said, Well, let me write this thing down. Hold on, I got your message. He went out saying, He was writing that down. And they start peeling off one by one. Now, she had sinned. 
Interestingly enough, the guy who initiated the sin was in there too. He was just as guilty as she was. He didn't condemn either one of them. He just wrote down, you know, some say he wrote down the sins of everybody that was present. I don't know what he wrote. All I do know is that they left. He without sin cast the first stone. Our role as believers must be that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and that everybody that we come in contact is a potential for the kingdom. And my response to them must be as Jesus was. I must live before them and speak to them. And, and I'm not saying don't call sin by its right name, but it's, there's a right time to call sin by its right name. And it's not for me from the pulpit. Now, I don't know if there are any pastors in here that have done this, but it's not me from the pulpit to say that all those who go that lifestyle are going to hell. Who made you the judge? Nor for an elder, nor for a deacon, nor for a deaconess, nor for an usher. Not for anyone to condemn publicly. And when you deal with them privately, uh -uh, it's still love. It's, if it's not mingled with love for the concern of their salvation, it ought to not be dealt with. If you cannot talk to, some about them, to someone about their sin in regards to being saved, what is that beaming log and gnat and all that stuff? You remember those words? Yes. I'm sorry. This, he's Okay. Uh, the log, you know, and the beam, you're calling sinners what they are, and you got something going on in the back that nobody knows, except for the people that live in your house. <laughs> and are you hiding it yourself? There are things, and, and, and so our young people, and I, and I, I was not giving the assignment. I was just given the privilege. And I'm coming to you for, as a privilege of an, as an older person who dealt with young people, and I know that the church wants to do what it should do for its young people. And so that's why I'm dealing with this hot topic. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's, that's why we're sitting here today. Yes, sir. We're not sinners. We're, we're, we're better than the guys up ahead that are here. Um, and I love the way you're presenting this thing. We, if Christ is within, we can explain what happened in a way that we can talk about and share the guilt with them. And, you know, it's a beautiful example that running to the well. He loved her enough to say, do you want to go pull your water up? Go tell the person. And she said, no. He said, you know, that, that's not exactly right. And uh, he loved her enough to ask her with a passion and a deep kindness to put his hand up. He's, he's bringing to the point, which is a very valid point, a very important point, and it's that it's from the inside out, the love that Christ had in, in, in the woman at the well. You know, he knew her before she got there. He knew what her life was like, but he led her to the session. She brought out the fact. She was a big gossiper, wasn't she? But she gossiped about Jesus. And so once the love of Christ is in, and I think that's where I really want to go, it hurts. It hurts when you see people living in the wrong way and you know it's wrong, according to Scripture, not according to your own ideas. When you read what the Scripture says, who's going to enter in and who's not going to enter it hurts when you see people go and you love them. But out of love and respect for the Savior, they need to see and hear Jesus through your voice. I think in any of the stories, whether it was the story of Mary Magdalene or the story of the woman at the well, in any of those places, it wasn't that Jesus was calling out their sin. He 
Amen. And, and I want to say this. I want to say this before I go further. I see your hand. And that is this. If you have a church, a membership of 200, and 200, or 20 are saying the right thing, and 180 are saying the wrong thing, the devil's going to send who he can to the wrong. So somehow or another, the church needs to be on board and understand this whole process is a grace thing. It's a saved by grace thing. It's not I've got to work my way through. I've got to be in the church so, so many years I'm going to be. No, it's a, it's a grace thing. But by the grace of God, I am where I am. And I'm growing. Real quick, the church was remembered by the disciples. Christ went back into the Samaria. They wanted him to extend what he had laid there. And he not only did it for their sake, but he did it for the church's sake, for the disciples. He extended that to them simply to try to make them respect their position. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you take a moment and reflect on the work of Jesus, he came to his own, but his own received him not. <laughs> his own were condemning of him, finding fault with him. And so in the process, he lived where he lived and touched who would allow him to touch them so they could still reach others. And our goal is our children, ourselves, and, our, and the community. And I'm Starting to reach into tomorrow. I don't want to reach into tomorrow. Uh, just want to encourage us to understand that there are hot topics that our young people are discussing, and they're looking at, they're reading what what is what is the pastor saying? What is the church elder saying? What are the leaders? What is the principal saying? And now what are they saying? What are they doing? Who's holding the conversation? You shut the door. Their ears into the door, and if they're not at your house, it's somebody else's house in the church, and they're getting it. And then you see, how, how, what would you say, you are, you're, uh, you come to church and you see a group of young people in the corner talking, and you got an idea what they're talking about, what would you say, how do you, how do you approach them? That, let's say they're talking about the, uh, the gay, gay community. Let's say you overhear something. And they pull you in. What would you say to them? Happy Sabbath, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's one way out of it. What would you say? Say, say? say that your daughter or your granddaughter is in the conversation with three or four of, her, of their peers. And you just, before you came in, you heard something about, my mom doesn't or my dad does. Or they're saying, you know, he is gay, and I don't know how they feel about that. What would you say? How would you approach it? Remind them that person is also a child of God. Remind them that person is a child of God. I think you can also just join in, like say, you know, what are your thoughts on this? You know, I'm interested in what the young people say. Interested in what the young people say. Okay. Okay. <laughs> oh my! You. You can't hide anything from the Lord. You can. You think you are, and you're foolish. You know, you you all are making. You all are contributing. Oh my! What times? Oh, what time I supposed to be done? Three fifteen, I think it is. Three o'clock. Whatever. What, what, what? Anyhow, you you are contributing in such a great way. Uh, because what the young people need. What they need. They need to know that Jesus cares. And he cares regardless.
Um, that's a whole central topic of what's going on in the church. I, I sang in a quartet. That was it. I mean, I was one of the bad kids in the church. <laughs> and so when they found out I was a minister, really? Huh? Yeah, oh, really? There was no real plan or push for me to be where I am except for in heaven. You follow me? So, yes, it is important that we deal with the hot topics of not only deal with relevant lifestyle situations, but because of the fact that the church should be about doing things outside of its walls and engage in in then somehow we need to equip, and so the best way to be equipped is to bring them in to show them that they're trusted, they have leadership skills, and if we, if we see an inkling of a leadership skill, let's help develop that so that they can become more engaging in what we are asking them to do, and so not what we're asking them to do, but what they're called to do. Because when you look at the history of the church, they did not call on seniors. They didn't call on the senior citizens. They didn't call on people my age. Don't be laughing at my age. <laughs> I'm only 69. But they didn't call people. They called them at 16, 13. The Lord himself called on a young girl to become the mother of the Son of God. Is that right? She was a young girl. Now, we don't know about all the dynamics, but the Lord knew what he was doing. You touch on something that's very important and that we need to move to another direction or further. And as she says that we need to cultivate, help them cultivate, some of them are ready now. They're sitting in churches and they're fidgety and using those little things, their phones and stuff, because they're not nothing to do in church. The church is just, I could do that. They could do that. And, you know, so we need to, we need to find ways and means and move them along so they can go and grow. One thing I appreciate about the school in Dickinson was that, that when I went there, they were, they were eager to do whatever they were asked to do because they felt important. And it's always good to help our young people feel important. So they have, they have a part to play in this thing called ministry. And the song I read at the beginning, it was, I hear the sound of the new breed marching towards the gates of the enemy. This morning we talked about the church being on the offense, going against hell's doors, going against the devil's throne. So the young people must be energized to go against the enemy for God. Hot topics, lifestyle, how do you approach it? What can we do to make sure that our young people are engaged when camp meeting is over? How can we make sure that they're anchored, we're anchored? How to help them to maintain being anchored when they don't go to a church school, and even sometimes in a church school there could be problems. Huh? I know, because I went to one from grades seven through college. I don't say it boastfully or braggingly, but from grades seven through 12, I got kicked out every year because I wasn't the best kid on the block. But those, those years have still helped me to develop somewhere in the back of my mind. I knew where I needed to go. When the time came, the Lord straightened me out. So, but what do we do when our young people in the neighborhood where you live, maybe some of you live on farms and so the neighbors are not too close. <laughs> They're a mile away. But they got something, they know somebody going to meet somebody. So how do you help them get anchored in Jesus By showing them Jesus, talking about Jesus, not as one who is overzealous, but zealous enough. I think it's always important to make them feel needed, too. Make them feel needed. So, so how do you do that? Everyone has to do that. Has to feel needed. Everybody wants to be needed, that's for sure. Anything else, any other hot topic? Some come across my mind, but I'm, it's not for me, it's for us. <laughs> 
So some things that are hot to me may not be hot to you. Yes. Um, the polarization of politics and how it affects spiritual leaders. Ah. Oh. Ah. <laughs> ah. Ah. Uh, I asked, <laughs> and I got it, <laughs> and I'm coming with you. <laughs> uh, yes. Back when I first heard it, I cringed. I alone can fix it. Whichever person said that was wrong. No man can fix it. But because the statement was made, people begin to follow and lean. Let me, let me see if I can do this in, in a nice way. The church, and it kind of comes back to some of the dynamics we're dealing with, the hot topics. Not only is the LGBTQ community a hot topic, but abortion is a hot, tap hot topic. You follow me? Now, some of you didn't want to say it, but it's a hot topic. <laughs> Who you marry is a hot topic. Yes. Uh, critical race theory is a hot topic. Uh, critical replacement theory is a hot topic. Listen to me closely. The church today, not when I say the church, you can try to decipher which one I'm talking about. The church today is moving in the same direction the church moved in when, when Christ was here. The church could not stand Jesus. So they had who crucify him. Okay, they, they, instead of yielding and following, they gave their power over to the government to crucify him. The church knows what the Bible says. And since people are not following what the Bible says, the church is saying, okay, well, government, you make them do it. You follow what I'm saying? And so to be able to separate church and politics, we have to be mindful of the fact that this world is not our home. There's only one Lord, the Lord Christ Jesus. He's the only one who died for us. So whether it's Biden or Trump or McConnell, I don't care who it is, it's got to be hooked on the word of God. And I can't buy into they ought not be doing this because the Bible says, and the government says. The government is not the Bible. It's a hot topic. Would I want my daughter, who's been raped by her uncle, to carry the child? What I want my daughter to abort the child. Do I want the government to determine that? Or do I want God to determine that? So the politics of our country versus the religious position of our country, two different things. We have to be people of the book. So don't leave here saying, well, Gil said we shouldn't abort, or he's against that. I'm saying we have to be sure that we're governed by the word of God. And we should not lean on the government to tell us which way to go. Scripturally. Am I making any sense? Yes, sir? Jesus was tried to be ruled in several times to be political. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you re the, the two brothers, the mother, one of the son, one on the right, one on the left. <laughs> she said, no, I, that's, that's not your deal. The father determines that. <laughs> and so, I, I, you know, the politics in the church, I mean, we, we, have what, we have our challenges. And so I'm not interested in whether you're a Democrat or Republican. Are you Christian? <laughs> is, the, is the end of the day. Are you Christian? If, and if you do this and they, because they said it, 
If you're against this guy marrying this guy, then be against it. But don't say, hey, would you all write a law that they should not better do this? Because they're coming down with a law soon that black can't marry white again. They're coming down with those laws. So do you want the government to dictate? Is that the politics? No, the church has enough politics itself. <laughs> let alone the government get into it. But at the end of the day, I, again, I say, the problem is that when you let the government do what the church is not able to do or willing to do or stand up to do, you let the government move in and do it, you have a whole different animal. And so we have in churches divided. We have liberals and conservatives. What about Christians? <laughs> uh, we have, you know, uh, so I don't know if I'm touching what you were talking about, but, but you brought it up, <laughs> and it was on my mind. And my wife said, oh, honey, don't. And I said, oh, I'm going to if it comes up. <laughs> because, you know, I, let, me, let me let you know something about me. Then I guess we probably need to close. What? Somebody look at the book and tell me how much time I'm supposed to end, please. Somebody do that quickly. <laughs> You're going to get in trouble. <laughs> can, I, can I be real with you for just a moment? Not like I haven't been before, but now. <laughs> just to let you know something. Um, this is where it gets risky for me. Um, I am a former Black Panther. I saw heads raise. <laughs> um, my wife and I, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, nine <laughs> grandchildren. Well, six that are grandchildren, no, seven, and then two, well, let me, anyhow, uh, <laughs> four of them all Caucasian. Our son-in-law and daughter have adopted them. They are ours. <laughs> Journey is the youngest. Journey is five, four months. <laughs> I love that journey. Uh, if you know anything about the Black Panthers and you know about white color, you know what, what I'm saying. I used to train dogs. I was in a dog training club. We trained German shepherds and Doberman pinchers to kill white people because we were so mistreated where we believe. And so what has happened in my life is because of God. I will hurt you if you mess with my journey. Journey is a baby. She has three other siblings. All four of them are Caucasian. When we come into the house, we talk to them every Sabbath. Hi, Nana, Papa. Happy Sabbath. <laughs> what you doing? What was your day like? <laughs> she got, my, we get pictures every day. I got, I showed, some, that's, those are ours. When I went home to California, where I grew up, uh, when my aunt who raised me passed, our grandchildren, three of them, came to California in my house, in my, the house I grew up. We came, they came. There was no disrespect because they knew where I, they know where I am. Um, so this idea now that we're up against in this country is the work of the devil. Just as plain as the nose on your face from every angle. Remember, I said it this morning, Adam and Eve were the first ones that came from the hand of God. Those are the original human being parents. So regardless of the color of my skin, we're brothers and sisters somewhere down the line. And if you can't accept that, you got a problem. And if the government dictates to you who you should love, who you should respect, who you should honor, who should not be the... That's all a work of the devil. Be sober. Be vigilant. 
For your, your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If he walks after you, he's walking after me. He comes after each one of us. Hot topics. We t I just mentioned it, but your young people are talking about it. I don't know what side of the fence they're on, but they're talking about critical race theory. They're talking about critical replacement theory. You better be up to speed. Oh, yeah, you better. And uh, the life, gay lifestyle is not as prevalent as these other secret things coming up. You know, and our young people are at risk. And I want to touch on something final that my sister touched on, and that is this. In this, in this category, mental illness is running rampant. And I gain say it's because of the confusion the adults have established. The total disconnect with each other, the total divisiveness, our young people not knowing what to do, who to turn to, because they're getting different signals. And at the end of the day, what do I do? Now you go to Buffalo, New York and just shoot up some black folk. For what reason? What do they do to you? You go to Uvalde, and the, the kids in, in, in the school, what, is, what do the kids do to you? What is it? And we as a church must get to the point of understanding that if we want our children saved, we can't let the school system teach them about that or ignore that. We've got to take time, make things relevant because at the end of the day, the Lord is looking for his sheep. And our children are part of the family. So now, whatever I've said, don't let it scare you. I love you. <laughs> uh, big time. Gary and I, you know Gary, right? The president of the union. Uh, we worked together. We would laugh and talk. And we had fun. And I know we'd go to some restaurants. People, one day Gary ended up in the hospital. And, uh, Troy and I were there. And uh, the nurse tried to tell us we couldn't go in. I said, well, that's my brother. She looked at me and looked at him. She looked at me. Gary said, that's right, so let him in. <laughs> and that's the way it goes. So I'm there. I'm there. I mean, that's, that's the reality. Because I realize that when I get to the kingdom, there's not going to be a black gospel choir. <laughs> And a white orchestra. <laughs> and I'll be playing Beethoven over here and Kirk Franklin over there. <laughs> here you follow me? And we have to get to that point if we're going to see Jesus in peace. And my prayer is that at the end of the day, we don't let the hot topics of society turn us away and cause us to go to hell for eternity. We're not going to burn forever, but you'll miss out if you let the world lead you in a misguided way. All right, my time is going, I think. Am I right now? 15 minutes. Well, no. <laughs> what time is it? 15, 15 more minutes? Okay. 13. okay. <laughs> I just need to know from you. I don't know if I've scratched where you itch or not. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to come here and share with you what's on my heart. Um, this morning, I dealt with the idea of uh, What? This morning, what did we deal with? One member. One member. Church of what? We're all one body, right? Today, this afternoon, what did we deal with? Hot topics. A general discussion. General dynamic. But at the end of the day, we're one. Any questions, any comments in the last two minutes, five minutes? Is there something that I didn't touch on, something that you're not comfortable with? Uh, please feel free to express it now because this is the best time to get me. I had to call Troy and say, Troy, you were right. <laughs> when you're retired, you have no worries. <laughs> Anything else? I think it's important to have discussions about these things, you know, openly, because too many people feel it's taboo to talk about them. Uh. And, you know, if we're thinking about it from our children's standpoint, they're already talking about them, and they sense if you're uncomfortable. They don't want to bring it up because they get in trouble or something. Yeah. You know. And I really appreciate you bringing that up initially about the children because that's what's important. Uh, they're, they're targeting how many children are leaving the church. Children are leaving the church 
by the droves. And they're being driven because of some things that happen in the body, the, the corner conversations, the shoulders, the cold shoulders, not being able to engage in church service. You know, they, they got, you know, one thing I opposed was junior deacons. <laughs> I, never read, I never read junior deacons in the Bible. <laughs> I never have. I don't know, I've never read that in the Bible. Deacons, ushers, elders. I mean, there's, there's, there's stuff to be equipped by, but we need to not put it off till they get 18 and 19. When you get 18 19, they won't be bothered. They got, they got their own stuff. You know what I mean? 18, you were ready to do your own thing, and if the church didn't use you, what's going on? I'm gone. Yes? Ah. Oh. <laughs> She said, as women pastors, a hot topic. She's going to close out in 10 minutes, hot topic stuff. Uh, <laughs> you know, pardon? I didn't hear what you said. I said, as long as you don't ordain them. Well, you know what? I'm, if it's left up to me, I say God is in charge. And if he called her to preach or to teach and be ordained, that's what he does. Uh, I, who am I to say, well, you know, uh, yeah. It's just as bad as the women athletes that weren't being paid the same amount as the women's soccer, men's soccer weren't being paid the same amount because they're female. Uh, so the country turned around and said, okay, we will, we will pay the female soccer players as much as we pay the men's soccer players. So, so, so women being ordained to the gospel ministry, where in scripture does it say that they should not be ordained? Believe it or not, a lot of our tradition comes out of the church we despise. A lot of our tradition comes out of the church we despise. I think for so many people that have a problem with it, it's trying to follow the agenda that God set up with the man as the head of the household and that we see God as he, you know, not the father. That is the balance, actually. The balance is if God calls it, God do it. For me to determine, for me to say, well, he called me, but he didn't call you, based on gender, is, is inaccurate. Adam and Eve, of course, we know that when sin came, Adam had to work by the sweat of his brow. Sweat of his brow. Eve was to give birth in pain, right? Was Adam working before sin? Was he working before sin? Yeah, he was working before sin. Was birth before sin? I think the head of the household thing came up. Was, was birth, giving birth by Eve before sin? Okay. So birth, Cain came after sin. But Adam worked before sin. He talked to the trees and whatever. He had a conversation with it, and they, however it went, there was some dialogue. But at the end of the day, when we talk about God choosing versus man choosing, who is to determine who makes the call? God determines. And when a man or a woman stands in the way of what God has designed, God can fix it. And my whole position as a minister of the gospel 
has been this. If God does not intend for a woman to be ordained, let God stop it. He knows how. Does he? He knows how to stop it. Uh, because there are men that have been ordained, and God stopped. And some he let slide, and they got stopped later. So God knows how to stop it. When we begin to compete with each other, again, that's the work of the enemy. The man is the head of the house, husband of one wife, but as Christ loved the church, the man ought to love the church and his wife. The man ought to give his life for his wife as Christ gave his life for the church. So should the husband be killed in place of his wife? But the question is about women in ordination. I heard that I was not at the meeting. I was not at the session. But I understand it was pleased. It passed. And so now, whatever your perspective is, and I don't know, whatever your perspective is, the union has decided to go along with ordaining women as called by God. You follow me? So now, to fight against it shouldn't be. You shouldn't be fighting against it now. Because if God wants to stop it, God will stop it. So let's not be an instrument of the enemy in trying to stop what God has not stopped. Yes. Union. union. Because the division is still kind of grappling with things. And that's because the division is a part of the general conference. Of course, you know that. And so... There is, and I think I touched on that this morning when I dealt with the idea that the devil tries to keep the church from being unified by dealing with leaders and leadership style. And that creates a division, creates problems because we're determining what this person says. This is, well, then we begin to fight against leaders. That's what the devil does. And I remember very distinctly in 2010 being on a bus, general conference, and somebody was saying, Oh, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. And I'm saying, what do you mean? What do you mean? But because of the leader style, they figured this is what was going to happen. And lo and behold, it has been contentious ever since. You know, we can't base our decisions outside. Of, we can base our decisions outside the word of God, but they may not be accurate. That's why I said, go to the word of God. I have not found anywhere. Where did you find where God said ordained man? Not only women, but where did you find where, he, you know, where God said? And remember, this is a word of God authored by men, inspired by God. Not word inspired, thought inspired. I look at the faces now, I better get out of here. <laughs> it's safe <laughs> listen thank you very much for your time and your interaction it's been very good meaningful to me I think I have one more session tomorrow after, tomorrow morning tomorrow morning I think it is yeah I think it's tomorrow morning 10 o'clock uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's something that, that I trust that will help us in our journey to stay anchored at the end of the day, that's what your camp meeting is about, being anchored. And everything we discuss, that's why I said let's be sure we're anchored in the word of God. Not in the word of web, the word of God. So if I said something today that you disagree with, don't leave here saying, well, Webb said this. No, no, just go back and read it for yourself. And whatever you do, don't get in a little corner and talk about web, because that's gossiping. And that's just as bad as, a, just as, bad as, as homosexuality. You know that. You can go to hell for gossiping just like you can go to hell for being a homosexual if you think that's the case. Isn't that something? Let's pray, and I don't know who's in charge, but I better pray and get out of here. Let's pray. Father, thank you very much for your love, your mercy, your grace, and your kindness. Oh, God, so much we don't understand, but yet there's so much you want us to do. For my brothers and sisters here, I pray that you would bless each one of us to follow as you lead. And where we kind of disagree with you, God, 
We thank you for your patience. We pray that you continue to lead us until you got us on the right path. Bless each one of us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.